Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Hag Sameach. Welcome to Etzheim's Arab Rosh Hashanah service. Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, celebrates the coming of the Kingdom of God and the coronation of the King, King Messiah, Melch Mashiach. So t- t- tonight, it's fitting to talk about the kingdom and what it takes to, to enter in. And, and a perfect way to do it is through a story that Yeshua told, the parable of the wedding banquet. Because the scriptures are often likened the kingdom of God to a great wedding banquet. So turn with me to Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read this story, this parable. Matthew 22, uh, Yeshua spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven... It's like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited, I prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted calf have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I've invited didn't deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, she noticed a man there who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This passage, this amazing story, is all about our need for mercy. We all sin and fall short of God's standards, of His glory, of God's glory. We all, therefore, need His mercy. We're especially attuned to this at Rosh Hashanah, which is also known as Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, the day when we all pass under the rod of God's judgment. We all take stock of our lives, and we ask the Lord to, to write us into the Sefer Chaim, to the Book of Life. We all desperately need the Lord's mercy, especially because he looks not only upon our deeds and our words, but also our hearts and our attitudes, our priorities, our desires, our motives, our secret thoughts. In fact, indeed, Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is active and alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates, even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So we all need God's mercy. But how does God's mercy come to us? How do you get it so that your name will be inscribed this Rosh Hashanah in the Book of Life? This passage tells us that God's mercy comes in three forms and in three ways. In verse 1, at the beginning of the parable, the text says, Yeshua spoke to them again. Well, who's the them that he spoke to again? Well, the prior chapter, chapter 21, tells us that the them are the Jewish leadership of the day, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the scribes, the the Pharisees. Uh, They come to Yeshua and they say, by what authority are you doing all these things? And what they mean is this. We paid the price. We earned our way to the top, the the top of the piety pyramid uh, and the religious pecking order. uh, Through our moral scrupulosity uh, and our doctrinal punctiliousness and the approval of all the right committees. We earned our place. We got the diplomas and the ordinations and the appointments to prove it. Who do you, Yeshua, think you are to come in here and do all this and to overturn the money changers and declare the temple as your father's house? And Yeshua looks at them, and he says, this reminds me of a story. And he says, do you think the kingdom of God is a meritocracy? 
Absolutely not. If anything, it's a mercyocracy. God's kingdom runs completely on mercy. And here's how you get it. Mercy comes, according to this parable, in three forms and in three stages. It comes as a call, as a covering, and as a feast. The first thing we see is that mercy is a call. Look at verses 1 to 4. We see that the king, who has a son, is going to throw this tremendous wedding banquet for the son. A -a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So he sends his messengers out. To whom? Who does he send his messengers? Look at very carefully at verse 3. Matthew 22, uh, verse 3. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. Notice they already had been invited. So why is he sending his servants out to invite them again, a second time? Well, back then it took weeks to prepare a banquet like this. And often it took days to come to the banquet uh, like this, to pack for the journey, uh, to the length, the length of the trip, staying overnight. These banquets often lasted for days. So these people who are, these are the people who already had said yes, already sent in their RSVPs and committed to going. They'd already been invited, they've already made reservations. And now, so now the messengers are simply coming to tell the guests, it's time to get dressed and to come. Get on your clothes, come to the banquet. But they don't. All of a sudden, they refuse. Now, who's Yeshua telling this parable to? As we've seen, he's talking to the priests and the Torah teachers and the scribes and the Pharisees, to the religious insiders. Most of you in this room tonight would actually fall into this category. You are also religious insiders. You believe in the Lord. You, you, uh, you committed your life to Yeshua. Many years ago, you said, I'm coming to the banquet. But here's my question for you tonight. Have you come? When you were immersed, you said, in essence, I'm coming to the wedding banquet, the, the, the wedding banquet of the Lamb of Messiah. But have you come? When you signed a membership covenant to join S. Chaim, for example, you were saying, I'm coming to the wedding banquet. But have you come? Are you fully and wholly living for Yeshua? Are you laying down your life for your neighbor? Are you fulfilling the great commission to to make disciples of all the nations? Are you daily dependent upon him uh, for forgiveness of your sins? Are you repenting? Are you humbling yourself before the Lord? Are you fleeing from anger and resentment and bitterness and pride? Are you fleeing from lust and addiction? Are you walking in forgiveness, forgiving all those who've wronged you? Every time you take the Lord's Supper, you're receiving an invitation and you're making a reservation. And you're saying, I'm coming to the Son's banquet, to the wedding supper of the Lamb. But have you really come? That is, are you living in conformity and consistency with that commitment? Would you want your every thought broadcast in this sanctuary or on TV? or on YouTube or Facebook? Are you taking every thought captive to Messiah and pulling down vain imaginations and every motive and intent and desire that's inconsistent with Messiah's kingdom? Every time you pray and you you cry out to the Lord for help and for mercy and for grace and for blessing, you're saying, I'm coming to your banquet. But have you come? Are you sitting down at the king's table? Are you rejoicing in his goodness? Are you dancing in his love? Are you experiencing it? Are you rejoicing in Yeshua with all of your heart? Ask yourself, this Rosh Hashanah night. These are the people who are religious insiders. A lot of us are religious insiders. We've made a commitment to Yeshua. We've been immersed. We take the Lord's Supper. We're members of a congregation. We're active in various ministries. Some of you are ministry heads. You said you're coming to the banquet. But have you come? The people in this parable never came to the banquet. Why not? What are the excuses they gave? Look at verse 5, Matthew 22, verse 5. But they paid no attention to the king's servants. They went off, one to his field, another to his business. They decided that what they have, their business, uh, their field, was more important than the wedding of the king's son. They paid no attention to the king. They made light of his invitation. They literally said they didn't care. They said what was off, they saw what was offered to them and they decided it wasn't as good as what what they had. They valued their current life more than the kingdom of God. So they were indifferent to the invitation. 
But verse 6 shows us that under this indifference was actually a hostility. Look at verse 6. The rest of those invited seized the king's servants and mistreated them and killed them. Verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy them, destroy those murderers, and burn their city. Now, if you consider this kind of an extreme reaction to the king, think about it. What if we had a U.S. embassy in a foreign land housing official representatives of the U.S.? What if that embassy was stormed one night uh, and everyone in it was slaughtered? Wouldn't you, you wouldn't think that, would, that would be an extreme reaction to go to war over this. No, of course not. This is an act of war on the part of the foreign nation where the embassy is located. They attacked U.S. soil where the embassy is, and they murdered our citizens and official representatives. So what we're being told here is you can be a person on the outside who said, yeah, I'm coming to Yeshua's banquet. You may have said a sinner's prayer sometime, and you've given your life to Yeshua. You may have been baptized, immersed in his name. You, you formally committed to him on the outside. But on the inside, there's no feasting. There's no delighting. There's no actual change to life and transformed heart. There's no real coming to the banquet. There's an indifference. Except that ultimately, that indifference is more than just an indifference. It's really an hostility. An hostility against the king and his son. It's a way of saying that, that it's, a, it's a way of saying this, that nobody, nobody can tell me how I live my life. So we see this call to the banquet. The kingdom of heaven begins this way, with this call. Anyone who comes, comes because they've been called. But this first group decides not to come. They reject the call. Later on, we'll see another group does come. Uh, they're also called, and they accept. So we have a test here to see if you've received God's mercy or not. There's a lot of very religious people, a lot of people with religious experiences, but here's one way of knowing whether your religious experience is one where you've really come into relationship with the living God. Anyone who's truly experienced the mercy of God, who, who has truly come to Yeshua the Messiah, knows this wasn't your idea. Anyone who says, I've decided to commit my life to Yeshua the Messiah, within minutes or within hours, certainly within a few days, comes to realize that you were decided upon. I know it's true for me. After I gave my life to Yeshua and I was saved, I looked back, and, I'm, and looking back, I could see the invisible hand of God guiding me for years to reach that point, drawing me, wooing me, uh, superintending the events of my life to lead me to him. And therefore, the very important first point here is that one of the ways you know you've had the mercy of God in your life is that you know this. We'll put this on the overhead. There's a saying by uh, Josiah Condor. This is a little poem. "'Tis not that I have chosen thee, for, Lord, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, hadst thou not chosen me." You know it. You realize he's been drawing you over and over repeatedly. You know it. You've experienced it. You say, ultimately, it wasn't so much that I came to Yeshua. No, I thought I was. But afterwards, I realized he came to me. He was drawing me and pursuing me. And that's the acid test of the genuineness of your relationship with the Lord. And tonight, I believe that God is also calling some of you. Like the wedding guests, you can choose to say yes or to say no. So some are called, and some say no. Some are called, and some say yes. And there's a, both a warning and a comfort here. Here's the warning. There are many of you here tonight, some of you I know, who are still trying to figure out who this Yeshua is and, and what, you, what you want to do about him in your life. And you were led to come here for whatever reason, that this era of Rosh Hashanah service. Maybe, somebody, maybe someone brought you here. Uh, maybe your spouse or your parent is a Messianic believer. Maybe you're trying to figure out what you believe about Yeshua, whether or not to seek him for the forgiveness of your sins and commit your life to him. And, and some of you are feeling uh, a tug right now. You are feeling a spiritual tug. You're feeling a call. Yeshua is calling to you. Some of you he's been calling to for a while. Don't keep putting him off. Don't postpone. Today is the day of salvation. In fact, it's very dangerous to ignore, ignore this call. 
and to say to yourself, oh, maybe I'll respond later. It's dangerous because you are incapable of coming just whenever you want. You mustn't say, well, uh, this is Shua stuff. It's pretty interesting. Maybe next year, maybe next Rosh Hashanah. But you can't just come when you want. You cannot just come when you want. This is the picture the parable is painting. Someone says, I've got this great home-cooked meal for you, fresh from the oven. You say, okay, I think I'll come over next month for it. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. It won't be there next month. You can only come to the meal when you're called. You can only come to the banquet when the banquet's being thrown. You can't just say, I think I'll come to your banquet next month. I won't be there then, no. If you say, I'd like to have God, but I don't know if I want him right now, I'll come to him later. That won't work because you won't want to come to him later. One thing you're experiencing right now is his mercy. You're giving yourself far too much credit if you think it's all you or even mostly you. A dead man doesn't suddenly say, I think I'll get up. If he says that, he's not dead. <laughs> if they rise from the dead, it's only because someone has put life back into them. The Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. That's why we pray for forgiveness on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. If your dead spiritual sensibilities are beginning to wake up, it's only because Yeshua is at your elbow right now, prodding you, moving along in your life. So don't be like Augustine, who said, God, make me pure, but only after I've gotten to know that little cute girl in the, in the pub. <laughs> Lord, make me pure, but not yet, later on. <laughs> Think of the folly and the inappropriateness of that attitude. If there is a God who created this whole universe, who's filled it with billions of stars and, and solar systems and galaxies, he holds it all together with the word of his power, with his little pinky. And so if he's calling you, you don't say to someone like that, wait, just hold on. You don't say, your Lord will come into my life when I call you. How dare you have that attitude? You must come to the Lord when he calls. Not when you decide it's a good time. To say, I'm not going to come until I'm ready, is essentially to say, I'm in control of God. Or to act as if there is no God. Or only a God of your own making. But who cares about a made-up God? <laughs> a God of your own making. That God can't possibly save you. If there is a real God, you must come when he calls. Hopefully today. And that's the warning. There's also a comfort here as well. And this comfort is especially to those of you who worry about, oh, I'm going to fall away, or I'm going to lose my faith, or, or fall into the devil's snare, or yield to temptation. Don't you see when you say, I don't know if I can keep you know, faithfully following Yeshua? Yeah, sometimes it, it seems so hard. I've got so many struggles and, and strongholds and sins. Don't forget this. Every bit of your believing life, your walking with the Lord, all your good desires, even your fear of falling away right now, all of that is a gift from him. And one of the reasons why you're not more aware of how much he loves you is that you actually give yourself too much credit. We forget the doctrine of the call. Here I am, scared maybe I'm going to lose God's love, but it's only by God's love that you're scared in the first place. You're not meriting his mercy by keeping up. It's just the opposite. You're only keeping up by his mercy. So rejoice. God's working in your life. Mercy comes through a call. You've got to respond. You've got to say yes to Yeshua and put your trust in him and submit your life to him. Mercy is a call. Secondly, mercy is a covering. Yeshua, what, you know, Yeshua just wasn't born. He came. He existed before he was born. He's the only one who has ever pre-existed his own birth because he's both the son of God and the son of man. He's both human and divine. So he came to earth with a message. And that message is continually misunderstood. All throughout the New Covenant Scriptures, you'll see if you look carefully, that both on the one hand, the libertines and, and the liberals, they thought he was a conservative fundamentalist. And the fundamentalists, they thought he was a liberal. And the reason for this is because the gospel doesn't fit into any human category. And Yeshua was always threading the needle and refusing to be in either camp. And there's no place that he threads this needle better than right here in this parable. 
And it's such an amazing teaching. You know, it's such an, this parable is so amazing that a lot of commentators try to claim Yeshua never really said these words in this parable. And at first blush, kind of looks like the king in the parable changes his standards. Because this first group of people, they were invited to the banquet. They were the landowners. Look at verse 5. It talks about them going off into their fields, into their businesses. They were the landowners, uh, the businessmen, the kind of people you would invite to a royal wedding. But now he says to his servants, let's change our strategy. In verse 9 he says, let's go out to the street corners and invite anybody you find. The phrase here in the Greek uh, for street corners is literally the way that the ways cross which is a term for the place in which all the major thoroughfares would enter the city limits. So here's the city. All these major thoroughfares come into the city. There are all these, these public squares, places where major roads come in from all sorts of other places, uh, that they, and they, they come together um, into and out of the city. You, know, you, don't, you don't need a lot of roads in the countryside. So you have one major road coming in here like this, and one well, like this, and, but as soon as they hit the city limits, uh, they spread out. You get all these intersections and these places where everybody would gather. You would see everybody. You would see the rich and the poor. You would see the Jew and the Samaritan. You would see the Gentile and the pagan. You would see the black and the white and the brown and the yellow. Every ethnicity, every educational class and social class. That, that's the place where the king says, let's go there. And he sends his servants out. And he invites, uh, and instead of bringing in only the, the high society, he brings in everybody. And this means that only would it be diverse ethnically uh, and economically and socially, but even diverse morally as well. And one of the most stunning passages anywhere in the entire Bible, the king, who is God, invites to the wedding feast of his son, who is Yeshua, the Messiah. He invites both the good and the bad. Look at verse 10. We'll put it on the overhead. It says, So the servants went out into under the streets, and gathered all the people they could find, the bad, as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Both the good and the bad come in. So it sure looks like we've gotten rid of, rid of all standards, right? At one point, at one point it looked like you had to be a person of a certain standing in order to come to the wedding feast. But now anybody can come, anybody at all. It's absolutely free. It's amazing. But there's a very strange ending to this parable, isn't there? One man walks in, and the king has come to meet his guests, and he notices this one man, this one guy not wearing any wedding clothes. Now, why do you need to wear expensive garments to a high occasion like this? You know, back in the 60s and the 70s and in the hippie movement, we always used to hate dressing up, right? People thought it was, it was cool to wear jeans to a wedding. And we said, this is an empty formalism, you know, getting dressed up. <clears throat> but it's not an empty formalism. It's not a mere convention. When someone gives you the high honor of inviting you into something at the heart of that person's life, you dress up and you go to the expense of doing so, doing so, why to show honor and respect to your host who put all this on for you. But this man thought he could go right into the king as is. This man thought that his everyday wear was fine. This man thought he could come as he was. That it should be, that that certainly should be good enough. So the king approaches him. Look at verse 12. Friend, he asks, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Now, his speechlessness is critical to the whole story. Now, there's two good reasons why someone might not have a wedding garment on. One reason is because um, I don't have one on because I didn't have a chance to go home and get it. The second reason is, well, I don't, I don't, I don't own one. I don't, I don't own a tux or a wedding gown. But he doesn't say either of these things, does he? And here's the reason why. If you look back up at verses 3 and 4, the original guests were invited, having been invited. In other words, they were already invited a long time ago, and the king's servants just went out to let them know, now's the time to come. But then he compared it to verses 9 and 10. The servants went out into the streets, and they gathered all the people in, anyone they could find. They weren't taking reservations like before. They just said, come right on in. And therefore, none of these people could have possibly had their own wedding garments with them. A, because they didn't have time to go home and change. They came right in. B, because many of them would have been very poor and wouldn't have had any, owned any in the first place. And therefore, the king must have provided wedding garments for them at his expense. 
He made them available at the door. But this guy, even though the garments were right there at the door, he refuses to take one. Notice when asked about it, he's speechless. He couldn't say, I didn't have a chance to go, because nobody had. He couldn't say, I don't own one, because, because almost nobody did. Rather, the free garments were offered to him, but he refuses the king's robes of righteousness. And therefore, he's thrown out. Now, what's the point here? A lot of commentators get very upset here at this verse. The, li the liberal commentators even go so far as to say, Yeshua could never have actually said that, to throw the guy out. Somebody must have added it in later on somehow. Because the commentators see the first part of the parable, they like the first part where it says, there used to be all these strict standards, but now Yeshua is here, he accepts everybody, just as you are. He lets in anybody, the good and the bad. They love that part. Yeshua was talking to the Pharisees who believe that your place in the kingdom of God must be earned. And it looks like Yeshua is now coming along saying, no, no, no. Your place in the kingdom of God is absolutely free. You just come as you are. So which is it? The way the parable ends with this man being thrown out of the wedding into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, this ending really screws everything up. Because if it's earned, like the Pharisees say, then how can both the good and the bad be there? How could Yeshua say, at my wedding feast, there'll be bad people? I've embraced them. Okay, so it's not earned. Okay, but on the other hand, if it's free, then how could this guy be rejected and thrown out? This is where Yeshua so beautifully threads the needle. This is why the liberals think he's a fundamentalist for throwing the guy out, and the fundamentalists think he's a liberal for letting the bad people in. Because on the one hand, Yeshua says, I'll take anybody. Your past record means nothing. But on the other hand, he says, you can't just come in as you are. You've got to be wearing my wedding garments. Amen. Yeshua goes against both the liberals and the fundamentalists. Amen. And here's why. The king let anybody come to his banquet, anybody, no matter what your record was. But he clothed them at the door with his robes of righteousness washed in the blood of Yeshua. Amen. So God at his own expense, at a far greater expense, at an infinite expense, he'll take anybody. And your record means nothing. Your social economic background means nothing. Your standing means nothing. You've come into the feast of the sun, not because you're so fit, but by admitting that you're not fit. By letting Yeshua close you with his robes of righteousness. Now, there's many people, maybe some of you right here in this room, who say, yeah, I don't like those Pharisees. I don't believe you got to earn your way to heaven like those Pharisees did. I don't believe in a God of wrath. I don't believe in a God who punishes people. I don't believe in a God like that. I believe a God who accepts everybody, just as you are. Now, if you believe that, with all due respect, you're coming in without a wedding garment. Do you really believe in a God of love who accepts everyone just as they are? ISIS, Hitler, Stalin. Look at the cruelty in this world. Look at the evil and the oppression and the torture and the death and the slavery. Look at all the injustice in the world. If, you, if we have a God who says, I love you all just the way you are, what hope is there for this world? What hope is there ever for justice? What hope is there to ever right the wrongs? Is your God of love a God of injustice? That's not a very good God. The biblical God, the true God, gives us hope for the world because the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, says, I will square everything in the end. There will be justice. There won't be one unjust deed that will not be paid for. But the biblical God says it can be paid for in one of two ways. Either you pay or my son will pay. And therefore, unlike traditional religion, Yeshua says you don't have to earn your place in my kingdom. But unlike the modern religion of God just accepts everybody as you are, there is a price to pay. God does not accept you unconditionally. He accepts you counter-conditionally. At infinite cost to himself if you repent and trust in him and what he's done for you. And therefore, unless you realize 
If you try to go right into God just as you are, you're going to be thrown into outer darkness. Unless you believe that, there is no hope for you of entering God's kingdom. And there'll be no joy in your life. This man in the parable doesn't experience any joy. How do you know you're going to the, king, to the king's banquet, to the Messiah's wedding feast? Here's the second test. How do you know you've experienced the mercy of God in Yeshua? Do you believe God loves you? Yes. Are you thrilled about it, though? Are you amazed? <laughs> Are you astonished? Do you see what's going on here? Uh, here's how people were talking in the first group, the first group of people with the original invitations, you know, the high society folk. They said, well, of course, I always knew I'd be invited. You know, this is a big gala. This is the king's feast. After all, I'm from a noble family. I'm a successful businessman. Who else is he going to invite? Of course, I'd be invited. But the second group, the ones ushered in from the street corners, they're saying, yesterday I was begging in the street, and now I'm eating with the king. This is incredible. Now, unless you feel this way, unless you feel like, I know I am a worthless sinner. If I just walk in as I am, I'll be thrown out into the outer darkness. This is a holy God, but he has clothed me at infinite cost to himself through the death and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, who died on the cross for my sins. Wow! <laughs> Hallelujah! I didn't deserve this! Praise God for his mercy! Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your grace and your favor. If you believe this, if this is your attitude, then you're galvanized, aren't you, by the, by the, God, the very idea of God's mercy for you. You're thrilled with the idea of God's mercy. You're changed by the idea of God's mercy. You're transformed by God's Spirit. But some of you are here, and you may say, yeah, I believe in God's mercy, but you really don't. Because you believe in a God whose love for you costs nothing. And that's the point. The point is salvation is free to us, but it's not free to God. You see, the liberal theology says it's free. Conservative theology says it's expensive. Fundamentalism, traditionalism, legalism says you got to pay the price. Liberalism, progressivism, relativism, universalism says it's absolutely free without any cost at all. God, God accepts everybody. But the gospel says it's free to us, but infinitely expensive to God. The gospel is that you are so wicked and sinful and lost, you'll be thrown into outer darkness unless clothe what Yeshua the Messiah has done for you. But at the same time, the gospel also says you are so loved and so cherished that he was willing to clothe you and willing to die for you. And if you don't embrace that, your life won't be changed. The thought of God's love won't amaze you or transform you or enrapture you. It won't. One more thing. Charles Spurgeon, this famous British pastor, said this. He says, you always want beggars at your feast because the prim and proper ladies sniff their nose at the food and compare to their last party. But the beggars cheer for every dish. <laughs> Imagine that. The beggars. Here comes another, another one. Look at that stuffed chicken. Oh, look there. Look at the size of that turkey. Hooray for the turkey. <laughs> the beggars cheer for every dish. And ultimately, only the beggars, only the beggars, the poor in spirit, those who know they are needy and spiritually bankrupt, and they're the other ones who repent, only the beggars enter the king's feast. The beggars cheer at every plate. Do you? Are you changed by the mercy of God? Or you just take it off of granite? You may say, yeah, of course I believe in the mercy of God. I ask for his mercy from time to time. But if that's all, if you have not really surrendered your life to Messiah, and you're not walking with him, if you're not transformed and overwhelmed by his love, then you're going in without a garment. If you say, sure, yeah, I've got sins, everybody's got sins, but God accepts us as we are. That's his job. God's job is to forgive. If that's your attitude, you're trying to go in without a wedding garment. Because God's mercy is not an abstract sentiment. It is a covering that totally transforms you from the inside out. Now, lastly, mercy is a feast. 
Salvation is a finished work by God given to us as a gift. It's not a process, but which you slowly bring yourself into God's acceptance. And what's so intriguing about this parable is that the only guy who's thrown out, it's not the bad people. They're not thrown out. It's not, it's not the street beggars who, who've never in a million years hoped that they would see the inside of the king's banquet. They're, they're happy to, to, to take the wedding garment when it's offered to them. Uh, the only one that's thrown out is the one who feels that he's fine as is and doesn't need the wedding garment. The only one thrown out is the one who minimizes his sin, thinks he doesn't need Yeshua's covering, isn't overwhelmed by Yeshua's love and all that Yeshua's done for him. What this parable is saying is that if there's no feasting in your life, if there's no astonishment, uh, if you're not cheering for every dish, then you may not have truly experienced and embraced Messiah's mercy. Every good thing in your life, everything, everything, the, you got into the college of your choice, you made good grades, you got this scholarship, you got, you got into grad school, you got a job, you got someone who loves you, you got several people who love you, all the blessings in your, in your life. Are you on your knees, thanking and weeping before God in joy and glory and gratitude and thanksgiving for them? If not, here's why. You know why you're not sharing for every dish? The meaning of this parable is that it's not your sins that really keep you from the Lord. It's not your badness that keeps you from the Lord. It's your goodness. It's your good deeds. It's not your sins that really keep you from God. It's your damnable, damnable good works. It's the things you think make you good enough to enter God's kingdom, God's wedding feast on your own. The reason why you're not amazed at every good thing that comes into your life, the reason you're not cheering for every plate, is because you feel somehow like you deserve it. Or you deserve better. And the reason why some of you are very bitter before God it's because your life hasn't gone the way you want it to. It's not going right. You say, I know other people, they're not as good as me. Their lives are going better. It's not fair. Do you see what's going on? There's basically two ways to kick God out of your life and take control and, and to, and, and to uh, be, any, be your own God and control your own world and be your own Lord and Master. One way is to be absolutely bad. Absolutely bad. You say, I'm going to cheat when I want to cheat. I'm going to lie when I want to lie. I'm going to commit sexual immorality whenever I want to. The other way to kick God out of your life is to, to totally control him and, and totally control your own world and be your own Lord and Master is by being good. By being good, you tell God, you owe me. By being good, you can tell other people, you owe me. By being good, by thinking that you're following all the rules and not do something special, and, and in your heart... If you're motivated by this religious, this, this legalistic spirit, you, you completely sap your life of joy. Because you look at your goodness and you say in your spiritual pride, I'm a good person. I deserve better. I've earned it. But if you look at your badness and, and you're honest with yourself and you see your, you see your own unfitness, you see what Yeshua has done for you, then and only then, do you cheer for every plate? There's a playfulness, there's a, a celebrativeness in your life. There's constant gratitude to God and thanksgiving for, for saving you, a sinner. Your whole life becomes a feast. Let me end this way with this story. I just got back last month from Scotland. Uh, we, Elizabeth and I went for our 31st wedding anniversary. My wife's family is actually Scottish, go back far enough. Well, there was a Highland Scot named Murdo McDonald, true story. During World War II, Murdo McDonald was captured and put in a POW camp in Germany. He was captured with another Scot who was a chaplain. They were put in two different areas of the POW camp, uh, one with a British group on one side of a big fence, the other with an American group on the other side of the fence. And these two acted as the chaplains for the POWs. And once each day, they were allowed to come together at the big fence in the middle of the camp and talk to each other briefly. But the German guards were always there, and the Germans knew German, and, they, and of course, and then they knew English, and they knew French. But they didn't know Gaelic, the, the native tongue of Scotland. One of the Americans had secretly made a homemade shortwave radio that the Germans didn't know about. So every day, Murdo MacDonald uh, would come to the gate and give the latest news to his friend in Gaelic. Well, one day he comes to the gate, 
And he said, Germany has surrendered. The war is over. But the guards didn't know about it because all the communication had totally broken down. Murdo gives the news in Gaelic to his friend who takes it back to the British barracks. Uh, and the next thing you heard was this incredible cheer going up in the barracks. The Germans had no idea what was going on. For the next three days, Murdo says, we were still, yeah, although we were still technically prisoners, we walked around on cloud nine. We thought we were at a party. We no longer complained about the food. We didn't hate the guards anymore. We smiled at them. On the fourth day, we woke up and all the guards were gone. They finally got the word. <laughs> they left all the doors open and unlocked. But in essence, he says, we were liberated by the news before we were liberated by the guards. In the same way, Yeshua faith is about good news. Every other religion, every other philosophy is a system of merit. They say, maybe eventually one day you'll be saved. You'll be saved by striving. You'll be saved by what you do. You'll be saved by keeping the commandments. Yeshua faith alone among all faith systems is not advice about how to live better. It is news. It's not called good advice. It's called good news. Yeshua did not come saying, here's some good advice. Live according to these Ten Commandments and then you'll find God. No, he said, here's good news. I've done something for you that will save you. And if you trust in me, it'll transform you and enable you and empower you then to keep my commandments. He, Yeshua says, I have done it. I, uh, the saving work is finished upon the cross for all who come to me. Myrna McDonald gives us a perfect illustration of what our lives can be like. To the extent you understand we are saved by Messiah's mercy, but what he's done for you on the cross, not by your merits, not by your works, if you're not able to walk around no matter or what prison you're in and smile at the guards, if you, don't have, if, you, if you don't stop complaining about the food, then you don't know how complete your salvation really is. You just don't know. God is the one who calls us to be saved. Some of you here tonight are being called. You might have gone through religious phases before in your life, but you've never truly committed your life to Yeshua, and you've never been reborn from above. Yeshua is calling you. Tonight is the time for you to answer that call and say yes to the invitation to God's kingdom. Maybe you've even been immersed before. You've been baptized. You've been a member of a religious congregation. But the day is the day Yeshua is calling you and asking you to say, yes, I'm coming to your wedding banquet. I surrender my life to you. And for those of you who have already answered the call, many of you here tonight, the reason why you're not walking around smiling and cheering for every plate, even for the prison food, is because the truth of Messiah's mercy is not really real to you. Ask the Holy Spirit tonight to let your life be characterized by feasting with Yeshua by celebration, by tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Not just to know it intellectually, but, yes. but seeing what Yeshua has done for you. Yes. Ask the Lord to come to you tonight and to not delay. He says, draw near to me, and I promise I will draw near to you. Right. Amen? Amen? Let's stand and pray. I want the music team to come on up, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we come before you tonight this Rosh Hashanah night. We thank you, Lord, tonight, that through Yeshua's blood, through his death and resurrection, you close us, you clothe us with your robes of righteousness. And Lord, if, if, if anyone here is feeling your spirit's tug on their heart tonight, Lord, help them right now to take that next step on this Rosh Hashanah, on this new year, to repent and to embrace Yeshua in faith and to commit their life fully to his lordship. Lord, through our trusting in Yeshua, I pray right now you will inscribe our names in your book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Lord, I ask you right now, give us a glimpse of the true state of our soul before you and the blackness of our sin, and yet all you've done for us. So that no matter what we're going through or what we're suffering tonight, we can nonetheless be grateful to you with a heart of thanksgiving, and we can cheer at every point. Help us to see your love and your goodness and your blessing in our, in our life, Lord. Like the beggars invited to the king's wedding banquet, help us to truly cheer and rejoice at every plate. Because we pray this in your name, Yeshua. Amen. Al-Tameach.
Happy New Year. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.